Yes, the CIA was involved in the assassination of the president. Yes, the CIA was involved in the assassination of the president. Now, some people will not be surprised to hear that. They suspected it all along. But no matter how you feel about it or what you thought about the Kennedy assassination, pause to consider what this means. It means that within the U.S. government, there are forces wholly beyond democratic control. These forces are more powerful than the elected officials that supposedly oversee them. These forces can affect election outcomes. They can even hide their complicity in the murder of an American president. In other words, they can do pretty much anything they want. They constitute a government within a government, mocking by their very existence the idea of democracy. And people have known this for a long time. The people who knew would include every director of the CIA since November of 1963. And that list would include Obama's CIA director, John Brennan, one of the most sinister and dishonest figures in American life. That list would also include, we are sad to say, our friend Mike Pompeo, who ran the CIA in the last administration. Mike Pompeo knew this. We asked Pompeo to join us tonight, and though he rarely turns down a televised interview, he refused to come. So less than a year after the JFK assassination, the Johnson White House released something called the Warren Commission Report. And the report concluded that while their motives remained unclear, both Lee Oswald and Jack Ruby had acted alone. No one helped them. There was no conspiracy of any kind. Case closed. Time to move on. And many, many Americans did move on. At the time, they had no idea how shoddy and corrupt the Warren Commission was. It would be nearly 50 years before the CIA admitted under duress that, in fact, it had withheld information from investigators about its relationship with Lee Harvey Oswald. It used to be that conservatives like me dismissed uh, theories from the left about JFK's assassination as just left-wing conspiracy theories. But over time, uh, I think that the left looks as if they were quite justified in not trusting yes. the intelligence services. And I think the WMD pretext for the Iraq war was a red pill, a slowly dawning red pill for me. Um, and so now you just have to look just on, on a really basic level. You just look at the fact that 30 years ago, Congress, in a unanimous, bipartisan, uh, unequivocal, unambiguous decision, said that these all the JFK files have to be made public. Absolutely no reason to keep them back. As you say, it's almost 60 years ago. Everybody involved is dead. You're not worried about sullying uh, reputations or unmasking a spy overseas. No, there, there can only be two reasons for it. One is that you're trying to protect the CIA against um, allegations or, or revelations that it knew more than it made out about Lee Harvey Oswald. It had a huge file on him. They were investigating him or, or in, connect, in, in contact with him before the assassination and they didn't do enough to save JFK or protect the president. But but, you know, is that enough to really keep this secret going for 60 no. years? I mean, no. the terrible dawning recognition is that really this is about, as you said, protecting the institution. In April of 1964, a psychiatrist called Louis Joylin West visited Jack Ruby in his isolation cell in a Dallas jail. According to West's written assessment, he found that Jack Ruby was, quote, technically insane and in need of immediate psychiatric hospitalization. Those are conclusions that, puzzlingly, no one who had spoken to Jack Ruby previously had reached. Ruby had seemed perfectly sane to the people who knew him. Louis Joylin West pronounced him crazy. But what, what West did not say was that he was working for the CIA at the time. Louis Joylin West was a contract psychiatrist for the spy agency. He was also an expert on mind control and a prominent player in the now infamous MK Ultra program in which the CIA gave powerful psychiatric drugs to Americans without their knowledge. So of all the psychiatrists in the world, what in the world was this guy doing in Jack Ruby's prison cell? The media did not seem interested in finding out. In fact, the New York Times, in an extensive 1999 obituary of West, never mentioned the fact that he had worked for the CIA, much less his time in Jack Ruby's cell, which seems relevant. So you can see why non-crazy people would wonder about what really happened. And of course, many have wondered. In 1976, long forgotten, the House of Representatives impaneled a special committee to reinvestigate the JFK assassination. Their bipartisan conclusion? Jack Kennedy was almost certainly murdered as the result of a conspiracy. But the question is, a conspiracy by whom? Well, the obvious suspect would be the CIA. Why else would the agency withhold critical evidence from investigators? Is there a benign explanation for that, for maintaining this level of secrecy for this many years? Not that we're aware of. So we're being left with more questions than answers from this document dump, and the archivists are still blocking 4,000 documents. This is supposed to be a four-page document. Look at page two. There's nothing on it. <laughs> All right. Then look at page three. There's like one sentence on it. <laughs> There's another document, and this is a very serious problem. 
that people have. Look at this page. You can barely read it. It's illegible. I want to see the rest of the documents. L let me give you a hint, Jesse, at what should be there, but that's not there. Back during the days of the House Select Committee, a couple of researchers wrote a paper called Was Oswald an Agent of the CIA? They declassified 600 pages today from the House Select Committee, and I don't see that one in there. What happened to it? Why is it gone? You know, why can't we see that? In 1992, Congress passed the President John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act. And that act mandated full disclosure of all documents by 2017, 54 years after JFK was killed. The last administration promised to comply fully with that law, but under intense pressure from CIA Director Mike Pompeo, withheld in the end thousands of pages of CIA documents. Today, this afternoon, the Biden administration did exactly the same thing. That would be thousands of pages of documents after nearly 60 years, after the death of every single person involved. But we still can't see them. Clearly, it's not to protect any person. They're all dead. It's to protect an institution. But why? As World War II was breaking out, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt allowed British intelligence to come over and essentially build the precursor to the CIA, called OSS, from the ground up teaching Americans all the gangsterific spy agency tactics they had developed over the centuries. From that point on, British and American intel ops became deeply intertwined, especially when it came to controlling organized crime and using it to finance covert operations. The idea was sold to American leaders on the pretense that drug dealing and prostitution was going to happen either way, so they might as well control it and use the money that it generates for their ops. The CIA is technically forbidden from conducting operations on American soil. So they launder their criminality by outsourcing the operations conducted here to foreign intel services like MI6. Foreign intel services that have diplomatic immunity, so they legally can't be prosecuted no matter what they do, as well as unrestrained warrantless access to all of our calls, emails, text messages, and location data through an incredibly shady intelligence sharing agreement we have with them called Five Eyes. Since 1947, MI6 and the CIA have scratched each other's backs by using these outrageous legal loopholes to tee off on each other's quote-unquote problematic domestic political opponents. I also write about an effort um, to uh, sexually blackmail uh, John F. Kennedy, and that same sexual blackmail uh, network, it was British intelligence, uh, well, Brit British intelligence and British organized crime, they had previously taken down uh, the government in the UK in what is known as the Profumo Affair. And one of the same uh, women that was used in that network was taken overseas to New York, um, allegedly slept with Kennedy, and uh, then somehow the CIA allegedly helped her escape back to the UK. The FBI uh, arrested her and her apparent handler, uh, had her client list, sound familiar, but instead of releasing the client list, they destroyed it. And what was Operation Underworld? That's where uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence and the precursor to the CIA, the Office of Strategic well, Services, says. teamed up with well, organized crime. So. The main people behind it were Mayor Lansky, I guess representing the Jewish mob there, and then Lucky Luciano of the Italian Mafia. And so they basically came together. And in World War II, they formally teamed up with the Office of Naval Intelligence and the Office of Strategic Services, or the OSS, uh, OSS which is the precursor to the CIA. And this was justified as uh, necessary because it was the war, right? So a wartime necess necessity justification. But then the war ends and then, you know, the intelligence apparatus of the U.S. and these mob guys realize they have a lot in common and they work really well together. And so that's why in the 60s, in the 50s, you see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the uh, people involved in assassination stuff or the CIA after it was made. You see a lot of mob guys around, for example. You see over time that a lot of the same type of behavior um, is, you know, all sorts of things, including working with organized crime or drug cartels or what have you. So we're going to connect this together because the second part of your book is about Jeffrey Epstein. And Jeffrey Epstein yeah. obviously had connections to the CIA and the intelligence community. So it seems like they would set up, they would try to get this blackmail stuff on powerful people and then they could get them to do their biddings. But th so did it, but did it work with Kennedy? It seems like it didn't work. No, it, it didn't really work there because it was exposed uh, oh, to okay. an extent, the operation and traced back to British intelligence. So there was a very sloppy cover up uh, where uh, Mariella Novotny, who was the name of the girl, was uh, res uh, you know, how she was allowed to flee the country with a, the apparent help of uh, U.S. intelligence because at that time there was a very, uh, 
a cozy relationship, I guess you could say, and there arguably still is between U.S. and British intelligence, right? This book specifically explores how the nexus between intelligence and organized crime directly developed the sexual blackmail tactics and networks that would later enable the sexual blackmail operation and other crimes of deceased pedophile and sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, other books on Jeffrey Epstein focus on the depraved nature of his crimes or his wealth and his most famous politically connected friends and acquaintances. But this book, in contrast, reveals the extent to which Epstein's activities were state sponsored through an exploration of his intelligence connections. One of the things that really surprised me when writing this book is uh, how sexual blackmail pops up over and over again in various uh, big events and scandals in U.S. history. And so part of what I'm trying to to show and a big reason why I wrote volume one is to really uh, break apart the mainstream media narrative that Jeffrey Epstein was an anomaly, that his behavior uh, was exclusive to him, and now he's dead, so none of this stuff ever it doesn't matter anymore. This is a type of activity that has been done over and over and over again uh, in in our political system, and it was uh, you know a politi- it, it was a move, uh, and it's a type of operation really that was um, perfected first uh, by the mob. <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein isn't a one-off. This isn't some anomaly inside of our culture. This is a regular classic CIA PSYOP or classic CIA program to do this. This is how they get powerful people under the CIA's control to do their bidding. Yes, this is something that's been going on a very long time. In fact, the longtime director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, who was in charge of that agency for decades and decades and decades, the top law enforcement official in the U.S., he was sexually blackmailed by the mob in the 30s. Hoover and Cohn only joined that after they themselves had been entrapped. Yeah. Um, and this involved minors. Oh, so this no is something kidding. that's been going. Yeah. This is something that's been going on a really long time. So you're um, saying and even J- in addition to that, you're saying uh-huh. JF, J. Edgar Hoover was entrapped sexually with a minor by the mob, by the mafia. Well, so at first the he was involved in the sexual op- uh, blackmail operation after he was blackmailed by the mob. That involved children, but he was initially blackmailed because he was uh, a photo of him was taken having giving oral sex to his longtime deputy Clyde Poulsen. Uh, and that was taken by affiliates of Mayor Lansky uh, of the Jewish mob. And later those fell into the hands of James Jesus Angleton, uh, the first counterintelligence chief of the CIA. So that's another example of how the mob and the CIA like to share intelligence, right? And how the CIA can justify almost anything, right, in the name of gathering intelligence. I think actually in the UK, they have they passed a law recently where uh, intelligence agents or assets can even commit murder or any sort of crime as long as they justify it as intelligence gathering activity. So, um, you know, this is something that, that gets brushed under the rug because there's no accountability for U.S. intelligence services at all. If the CIA was involved in that assassination, that is the reason that you would want to keep that from the American people, because the fury that would erupt and this is a bipartisan fury. It'd be the one thing that would unite Americans at this unaccountable spy agency that is, uh, has decided that it is going to get involved in murdering, assassinating the duly elected American president. For what reason? Um, you know, there would be such a clean out of the CIA. I don't know if it would even survive. And so the trust in our institutions is already at rock bottom. The truth is the best disinfectant. And if the CIA did do this, was involved 60 years ago, then it needs to come clean. We need to have a reckoning. And so the reason that these documents have been secret for so long is because if the CIA or the FBI counterintelligence wants something done, they can go to the Crown and, and it's, it's a real crown, it's a real monarch, right? And according to the legal foundations of a monarchy, yeah. whatever they do, it's not illegal, right? The, the king right now, he could go out and he could shoot 100 people in the head in the middle of the street. He could never be prosecuted. That's, yeah. that's a hard set monarchy principle. The other thing is secrecy. They can keep whatever they order secret forever. So when the CIA wants to get rid of JFK, if they use the authority of the monarch to come do that and they use uh, MI6 agents with diplomatic immunity, then that essentially makes it so they can do this, get away with it, and keep it secret forever. And check out our site, www.qintel.pro, and this is uh, with documentation, with pictures, um, kind of goes through some of these topics we were talking through today so that people could see I'm not just yanking their chain and that this is actually a well-documented situation. Yeah.